John 14. God's got a plan and we're what? In we're in it if you choose to be in it. But if you're not willing to die, you ain't going to get in it. <laughs> Death. <laughs> you know, Jesus said, God delights in the death of his saints. Isn't that wonderful? He didn't mean just martyr. He meant dying to yourself every day. Amen? <laughs> and it's glorious when you do that. Then you get to watch the hand of God move. Amen. Or else you watch your own hand. And that ain't no fun. <laughs> Praise God. John 14 and verse 6. Can we all read this together? And Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except for through me. In other words, Jesus was God's calling card. He was actually God himself. He's going to reveal how he expounds, and you'll see the scriptures be expounded and, and what Jesus was really talking about, about the way, truth, and life. Because he says four things. He says, I am. The next three, three things he says, the way, truth, and life. Well, let me share something with you. If somebody comes into this world and says, I am the way, truth, and life, then he is everything. There isn't anything that he's not. Amen? <laughs> and he, <laughs> he expressed himself when he first revealed himself to Moses, and we'll go to that in a second. But I want to go to uh, Revelation 1. Revelation chapter 1. I am the way, truth, and life. Well, one of the things we got to look at is who is the way, truth, and life and the expression of who is the way, truth, and life and what is the way, truth, and life and the expression of the fullness of what is the way, truth, and life. So we've got two categories that we want to look at. Who and what. Is everybody with me? Hallelujah. <clears throat> Revelation chapter 1 in verse um, 8. And let's read this together. Thank you, Holy Spirit. <clears throat> Is everybody there? And Jesus said, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, says the Lord, who is and who was and who is to come, the Almighty. Now, I want you to look at Jesus expressing himself as the way, truth, and life, right? Now he comes and he expresses himself as who was, who is, and who is to come. In other words, he is not bound by space and time. Not at all. In fact, when you're in the Spirit, you're not bound by space and time either. And that's the importance about walking in the Spirit. We have a teaching called positioning. And we use this um, example an example of us is by walking in the Spirit. If you're walking in the Spirit, the Lord not only takes care of the present, but He heals the past and prepares a future. Does everybody get it? That's why Jesus is known as, I am the way, the truth, and the life. In other words, when you come to Him, when Jesus died for me and you on the cross, He covered all the sins of the past. He's covering all the sins of the present and any sin that you might commit in the future. But of course, it's covered by the word of repentance, which means confess, turn away. Amen? In other words, you can't just go out and willfully sin because you feel like sinning without a consequence or broken covenant. Amen. And by breaking covenant, you're no longer His. Amen. And people lose sight of that, and that's a whole other teaching. Okay. <laughs> Hallelujah. So we see Jesus expresses Himself also as by, in me, who I am, you're not bound by space and time. And what you're doing right now, what you're doing today, is not only affecting your future and establishing your present, but it's healing your past. Amen? Because that's our king. That's our daddy. He says he, he is the alpha and the omega. He is the beginning and the end. The beginning of what? The beginning of anything. The beginning. And he's also a representation of the beginning and the end for me and you as this time sequence that he has established because in the, in the book of Genesis the first scripture says in the beginning 
Well, we know that when God says in the beginning, then there must be an end. There's an end. And when he, he rolled out the scroll of the universe and he set a time sequence where everything would be established according to his way and his will, there would be a beginning and there would be an end and there would be eternity. Because ending isn't a representation of eternity. Ending means end. <laughs> then there is eternity. Amen? Psalm 19 and verse 1, please. Well, we're going to read this together and so in the Spirit more. Hallelujah. The heavens declare the glory of God. Now, if the heavens declare the glory of God, it means God has written Himself in the heavens. Does everybody understand that? He is written in the heavens. The expression of God and His awesomeness of His Almighty. In fact, even the 12 tribes of Israel are written in the heavens. Of course, then we know that the mediums and, and Satan polluted what God had done in the heavenlies. In fact, Daniel was one who was a, a star watcher. You know, he followed the stars. He knew how to read them. And the, and the following of the stars is a representation of herbs and all sorts of things which brought healing to bodies and so forth. You know, there was a sequence of goodness from God. In fact, the wise men were ones who followed the star, wasn't it? And then they, they found Jesus, and he was about two years old when they found him. But, so understand that God not only written, wrote his glory in the heavenlies to express himself so that you and I could always see Man, I mean, you know, you ever look up in the stars and go, man, that's God. Okay. You know? Praise God. Come on in. Praise God. <laughs> Everybody listening, come on in. <laughs> so we see here the heavens declare the glory of God in the firmament. What? Shows His handiwork. In verse 2. Day on to day utters speech, a night on to night reveals knowledge. There is no speech nor language where their voice is not heard. Their line has gone out through all the earth and their words to the end of the world. Now understand something. You know, God writes him. In fact, his name is even written in the earth in Hebrew. And I'm not going to go in depth in this. But even the nations were named after Jacob's sons, right? So God was expressing himself even in the earth, isn't he? And uh, you'll find that even certain rivers that coordinate together in Israel represent his name. So God writes about himself in the heavens and even in the earth, okay? Okay? In verse 5, or verse 4. Let's finish it. Let's read this again, verse 4. Their line has gone out through all the earth, and their words to the end of the world. In them he has set a tabernacle for the sun. In other words, he was preparing a tabernacle, wasn't he? He was setting a tabernacle for his sun. There is a tabernacle already set in the heavenlies. Already. In fact, Ezekiel saw the tabernacle of God. And then God went to Moses and told him about building a tabernacle for him. And we're going to go to there in a minute. And then David reestablished a tabernacle with God, which Solomon built. Amen? Okay. So we see that God expresses himself not only in the heavenlies, but even in the natural and in the earth. And the Bible says that the mountains melt in the presence of God. You know, you know, God's presence is increasing in the earth. That's why wickedness is increasing. Because it's being revealed. The Bible says that we groan and the earth groans. Because God's presence is increasing all over the world, globally. He's preparing a way for His return. He cleans it up. Then he comes. <laughs> In verse 5, it says, Which is like a bridegroom coming out of his chamber. And who's the bridegroom? Jesus. Jesus. 
and rejoices like a strong man to run its race. Its rising is from one end of heaven and its circuit to the other end. And there is nothing hidden from its heat. Now watch. It says, The law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise is simple. The statutes of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. What were these given? On written documents for man, weren't they? And it says, The fear or reverence of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The judgments of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. More to be desired are they than gold, yea, than much fine gold. Sweeter also than honey, and the honeycomb. More, moreover, by them your servant is warned. Hello. And in keeping them there is what? Great reward. Great reward. So we see God has not only written them and expressed himself in the heavenlies and on the earth, but on tablets. On documents. In fact, you and I have the writings right on our laps tonight. Known as your Bible. Amen. So I want to go to another part here that might express a little bit more understanding. Let's go to Exodus 3. Hallelujah. Exodus chapter 3. Now remember what we just covered in Psalm 19. Just kind of reflect back to that. And in Exodus 3, I mean Exodus, um, yeah, Exodus 3, in verse 14. Let's start at 13. Then when Moses said to God, Indeed, when I come to the children of Israel and say to them, The God of your fathers has sent me to you, and they say to me, What is his name? What shall I say to them? And God said to Moses, I am who I am. In other words, I'm, what do you mean? You know, if you really think about it, God never really revealed his name until Jesus came. He really didn't give him the name. They, he gave him a name of I am who I am. I am. I am everything. I am. And he said, Thus you shall say to the children of Israel, I am. He has sent me to you. Moreover, God said to Moses, Thus you shall say to the children of Israel, The Lord... God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob has sent me to you. This is my name forever, and this is my memorial to all generations. Now, the I am is a representation they used to call him Yahweh. In fact, because the Jews didn't even want to mention that name. But you've got to remember now, when Jesus came and he said, I am the way, truth, and life, it was the same God that said, I am the way, truth, and life that stood with Moses and said, I am. I am. And you're going to see a reflection of what Jesus, who Jesus, when he said, I am the way, truth, and life, you're going to see the reflection right here. We're going to go over it of what he was expressing in the Old Testament. So we see that the Lord showed up to Moses and he said, I am. That's the same thing when Jesus showed up and said, I am. Amen? Amen. Okay, let's go a little further. <laughs> Are you ready? Hallelujah. Let's go to Exodus 12. Exodus 12. Is everybody all right? Did I lose anybody? Exodus 12. Remember, paper doesn't forget. Hallelujah. <laughs> Amen. 
Exodus 12 and verse 21. So when the Lord was bringing the plagues on Pharaoh and removing his people from Egypt and uh, he was getting ready to do another move to get his children out. In verse 21 it says, Then Moses called for all the elders of Israel and said to them, Pick out and take lambs for yourselves according to your families and kill the Passover lamb. And you shall take a bush of hyssop, of hyssop, dip it in the blood that is in the basin, and strike the lentil and the two doorposts with the blood that is in the basin. And none of you shall go out of the door of his house until morning. For the Lord will pass through to strike the Egyptians. And when he sees the blood on the lentil and on the two doorposts, the Lord will pass over the door and not allow the destroyer to come into your houses to strike you. And you shall observe this thing as an ordinance for you and your sons forever. It will come to pass when you come to the land which the Lord will give you, just as He promised that you shall keep this service. And it shall be when your children say to you, What do you mean by this service? That you shall say, It is the Passover sacrifice of the Lord who passed over the houses of the children of Israel in Egypt when he struck the Egyptian and delivered our households. So the people bowed their heads and worshipped. Then the children of Israel went away and did so just as the Lord had commanded Moses and Aaron. Now, in verse 29. And it came to pass at midnight that the Lord struck all the what? Firstborn in the land of Egypt from the firstborn of Pharaoh who sat on his throne to the firstborn of the captive who was in the dungeon and the firstborn of the livestock. Now, so the Lord went through Egypt and everybody that put blood on the lentils of their door, right, God did not go in and strike. Does everybody understand that? But he struck the what? Firstborn. Okay. Now, Jesus says, I am. God says, I am. Jesus is what? He's the firstborn. The only begotten who would be struck. Does everybody understand that? Okay, let's go a little further. Hallelujah. Exodus 20. All right, now, wait a minute. I want to share something with you before we go further. The firstborn in Egypt were judged, weren't they? The firstborn of Christ is going to be judged. In fact, he's going to carry your judgment and my judgment on himself. Does everybody get that? This is why Jesus is known as the way. Is everybody with me? Because the blood was making the way of escape out of Egypt, wasn't it? Does everybody get it? See, the blood makes a way of escape out of the powers of darkness. Is everybody with me? So, in the Old Testament, we see here that here, God was already engraving, already establishing what was to come. Because the Old Testament is the shadow of things to come. Is everybody with me? Okay. So, we see G God shows up to Moses and says, I am. Then He tells Moses, okay, put the blood. I'm going to make a way. And I'm going to strike the firstborn so you can come out of darkness. Does everybody get it? Okay. Hallelujah. Um, let's go to Exodus 20. So Jesus now expresses, I am the way right here. And we're going to see more of this. It's powerful. Now, in Exodus 20... I'm going to make this real simple. Is everybody with me? Um, in verse 1, And God spoke all these words, saying, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of what? Egypt. Egypt out of the house of what? 
bondage. How did he do that? Through the blood. Because he made a way, didn't he? Through the blood. Now he says, and you have no, you shall have no other gods before me. Now what's he doing? He's giving them the law. Does everybody see this? And you'll see that he goes before all this and he gives Moses the Ten Commandments, doesn't he? Okay? And you shall have no other gods before me. And it goes on and says, and you're to remember the Sabbath. And you're to honor your father and your mother. And you shall not murder. And you shall not commit adultery. And so on. All the way to verse 17. So the next thing that the Lord does with Moses is he gives him the law, which is the what? Truth. Is everybody with me? <laughs> is everybody all right? <laughs> okay. <laughs> Hallelujah. So now he gives him the law, which is a representation of the truth. Amen? Yeah. Hallelujah. Now go to Exodus 21. <laughs> now remember when we talked in Psalm 19, he talked about the law, talked about judgments, right? Now look at this. Look at in verse 20, in chapter 21. And it says, in verse 1 it says, now these are the judgments. So he's not only giving them the law, but he's giving them the judgments. He's given them the oracles. He's given them all these things. Is everybody with me? Just like he said in Psalm 19. All right? And we'll, we'll go a little bit further. Go to um, Exodus 25. Exodus 25. Hallelujah. In verse 10. And let's read this together. And they shall make an ark of acacia wood. Two and a half cubits shall be its length. And a cubit and a half its width. And a cubit and a half its height. And you shall overlay it with pure gold inside and out. You shall overlay it and shall make it a molding of gold all around. Sounds pretty powerful. And you shall cast four rings of gold for it and put them in its four corners. Two rings shall be on one side and two rings on the other side. And you shall make poles of acacia wood and overlay them with gold. You shall put the poles into the rings on the sides of the ark that the ark may be carried by them. The poles shall be in the rings of the ark. They shall not be taken from it. And you shall put into the ark the what? Testimony. When we talked about in Psalm 19 about judgments, testimony, and law. Right? Which I will give you. And you shall make a what? Mercy seat of pure gold. Two and a half cubits shall be its length. And a cubit and a half its width. Come on, stay with me. And you shall make two cherubim of gold, a hammered work. You shall make them at the two ends of the mercy seat. Make one cherub at one end and another cherub at the other end. And you shall make the cherubim at the two ends of it of one piece with the mercy seat. And the cherubim shall stretch out their wings above, covering the mercy seat with their wings. And they shall face one another. The faces of the cherubim shall be toward the mercy seat. You shall put the mercy seat on top of the ark. It will be like a covering. A cover. Is everybody with me? And in the ark you shall put the testimony that I will give you. And there I will meet you and speak with you from above the mercy seat, from between the two cherubim, which are on the ark of the testimony, about everything which I will give you and commandment to the children of Israel. So we see here now, God was getting ready to meet. In other words, when you are face to face with God, you're talking about life. Is everybody with me? Life. When you're face to face with God, that's life. So the Lord says, okay, now when you build this ark, right, I'm going to speak to you from the mercy seat. 
Now the mercy seat was, if you look at the ark, was like a box. God put t testimonies in there and the bud and so forth and the, the, the uh, Ten Commandments and the manna and, and, and he put a cover over it. In other words, God's glory was a representation of in the ark, in his presence. He said, I'll speak to you from the mercy seat. So the glory of God would come down and speak to Moses. And who would he say he is? He is life, isn't he? So we see here, and I want to give you a couple sheets here, or a sheet, that Jesus expressed himself in the Old Testament, first of all, by visiting Moses by saying, I am. Then using Moses, right, and giving him what? Going through, making a way through the blood. Giving him the law and the oracles and testimonies and, and judgments, which is the truth. And now establishing a tabernacle on earth where he can actually come and speak to them and give them life. Does everybody understand that? Okay. Praise God. You know, when Jesus said to the Jews, I am the way, truth, and life, they were upset. Because there was a representation of the names of the doors of the tabernacle. And I want to give you the sheet here. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you. <clears throat> Praise God. Now, if you'll look at this, you'll see that it says again, this is John 14, 6. It says, Jesus, the way, the truth, and the life. Now, we talk about, it talks about entering in, doesn't it? This was, this is a representation of the tabernacle. The way is a representation of the outer courts. The holy place is a representation of the truth or and the Holy of Holies is a representation of life. And if you notice, there is the Ark of the Covenant where? In the Holy of Holies, isn't it? So we see that the way is the outer course, the truth is the holy place, and the life is the Holy of Holies. And that's where the Shekinah glory of God was at in the Old Testament, in the tabernacle. Amen? Amen. Hallelujah. Would you turn to Exodus 26? Okay, in, in Exodus 26, in verse 1, and I'm not going to go in great depth with this, and, and, it's, and, and the Lord is speaking to Moses and it says, Moreover, you shall make the what? Tabernacle. Tabernacle with ten curtains of fine woven linen, blue, purple, and scarlet thread, with artistic designs of the cherubim, you shall weave them. Now, what he's doing is he's, he's putting these woven linens or, or these curtains in between these tabernacles. And if you'll notice that on your sheet of paper there, you'll see where it says the altar and the laver, which was where the water was at, and the altar was the sacrifice, where Jesus, okay, where the blood was at. And you'll see here that these gates, like the gate of salvation, the, and all of these, these were gates. And these gates are known as, they're named there, in the, where it says gate of salvation is known as the way. The other gate entering in is known as the truth. And the other gate where the altar of incense is, it says is the life. In other words, these chambers were representation of, of way, truth, and life in the Old Testament. Does everybody see that? And Jesus came in the expression saying, I am the way, truth, and life because he was the tabernacle of God. Because he was God. He was the fullness of the tabernacle of God. He said, when you see me, you see the Father. Right? Remember he said, I am the way, truth, and life. He said, no one comes to me except for through the Father. Why? Because he was the Father. Nobody goes to Daddy except for through Daddy. Amen? Amen. <laughs> okay. Alright. Um, and now this was a tabernacle built with hands, wasn't it? Okay. In other words... It was an outward expression. Everything in the Old Testament was a representation of an outward expression. They used to have to kill the animals. They used to, you know, they used to have the rituals and washings and ordinances. There was, everything was an outward expression. It was not an inward expression. It was an outward expression. And God was expressing Himself by others to see what the rituals were. And the ordinances. So everybody was able to see what God was requesting in laws. 
um, he was preparing his entrance into the world. But he first had to do laying it out in the natural because the Bible tells us that the natural comes first, then the spiritual. Is everybody with me? So he had to lay it out in the Old Testament. It had to be spoken and it had to come forth in the natural. All things had to be fulfilled so that he was making way for his entrance to come into the world. Is everybody with me? Now, the Old Testament, what I'm going to share with you, was a representation of Yahweh, you know. The Old Testament, if you really look at the Bible in itself, the Old Testament was known as the way. The Gospels are known as the truth. And the New Testament is known as the life. Because it wasn't until the pouring out of the Spirit which gives life. Is everybody with me? Turn to 2 Corinthians 3. Hallelujah. 2 Corinthians chapter 3. So when you pick up your Bible, you actually have the way, truth, and life. <laughs> Second Corinthians chapter three. Again, the Old Testament represents the way, the gospels, and it's they're called the gospels of peace because Jesus came as the mediator to bring peace between man and God. So the gospels are representation of the truth, and the New Testament is a representation of the life. Because if you really look at it, the Gospels weren't a representation of the New Testament. They were the mediator between the Old Testament and the New. Because the New Testament didn't begin until Jesus poured out His Spirit. Is everybody with me? Okay. Now watch. In verse, uh, in chapter 3 and verse 4. Let's read this. 2 Corinthians chapter 3 verse 4. Let's read it together. And we have such trust through Christ toward God, not that we are sufficient of ourselves to think of anything as being from ourselves, but our sufficiency is from God, who also made us sufficient as ministers of the new covenant, not of the letter, but of the Spirit. For the letter kills and the Spirit gives life. Go on, verse 7. But if the ministry of death, written and engraved on stones, was glorious, so that the children of Israel could not look steadily at the face of Moses because of the glory of his countenance, which was passing away, how will the ministry of the Spirit not be more glorious? So we see that the, the New Testament is the ministry of the Spirit. Remember, the Lord said that the Old Testament was an old covenant. Okay, the New Testament is a representation of the New Covenant. In fact, that's why Moses had to go through two sets of tablets. The first one's broke. Hello? Because it had to be broke so that he can establish a new one. See, everything in the Old Testament is a shadow of that which was to come. Everything. Even the tabernacle, and there's a powerful teaching of the tabernacle of the colors, the wovenness, and I mean, it just represents Christ all the way, and the and the reason and the purpose of the wood, and every, I mean, it's just powerful. So we see here that tells us that that the New Testament is the ministry of the Spirit, and what does Spirit mean? Breath, breath, breath. That's why when you repent. You don't think it, you speak it. That's what activates the blood. So weapons of God are activated by your spoken word. That's how the weapons of God are activated. Amen? Okay. So remember, the New Testament is a ministry of the Spirit. We know that Jesus is the way, truth, and life and who He is. But He is the fullness of God. He is. Let me tell you something. He is and the devil isn't. Amen? Amen. <laughs> Let's go to John or uh, Matthew five. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. <laughs> Hallelujah. 
Matthew 5 and verse 17. Hallelujah. Simple, quick teaching. Is everybody there? Let's read this together. And just as Jesus is speaking, and He says what? Do not think that I came to destroy the law or the prophets. I did not come to destroy, but to what? Fulfill. What was He doing? He's fulfilling what was written, what was built, what was manifest in the Old Testament. That's what he was doing. He was fulfilling everything in the Old Testament. And verse 18. For surely I say to you, till heaven and earth pass away, one jot or one tittle will by no means pass from the law till all is fulfilled. Whoever therefore breaks one of the least of these commandments and teaches men so shall be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever does and teaches them, he shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I say to you, unless your righteousness exceeds the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, you will by no means enter the kingdom of heaven. So he's telling us, listen, okay, here it is in the Old Testament. This was the laws. But I'm telling you, because I'm going to live in you now, your righteousness must exceed what theirs were even though they obey the law. Why? Because there's more judgment for me and you than them. Because God has come and given me you, me and you His power and so that He can live within us and we can be the tabernacle now. See, it's more serious now than it was then. Amen? Amen? Let's go to John chapter 1. So we know that the Lord had to come and fulfill everything, didn't He? In verse 14, John 1, verse 14. John chapter 1, not 1st John. John chapter 1, verse 14. Is everybody there? Let's read it. And the Word, or you know what you can say? Now listen. The Word, or what? The Law. Amen? It was the, Jesus was the Law also. <laughs> when they wrote the Ten Commandments, it was the Law Jesus was the law. So you see here, the Word or the law became flesh <laughs> and dwelt among us and we beheld His glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of what? Grace and truth. In other words, He was holding back His judgment and He was bringing truth for me and you. Amen? So the fullness of God was coming forth. Now, we, let me share this with you. Here is the way, truth, and life. Watch. The Word represents the what? The law, right? Okay. The Word, alright. Which is representation of the letter or the truth, right? We see now grace represents the Spirit because He's known as the Spirit of grace, wasn't He? And the truth represents His true, the Spirit of truth or the true law. Now watch. The Word, which was the law, all right, or the Word, which was God in the beginning, came and manifest Himself. We know that that represented He was the way. Amen? And the truth represents, in other words, the truth. And the grace represents the life. So we see here just in this verse alone that Jesus was expressing, I am the way, truth, and life, who became manifest. Is everybody with me? Okay. Hallelujah. And Hebrews... Well, you know what? I want to go somewhere else right now. I want to go to 1 John chapter 5.
First John chapter 5 and verse 6. Can we read this together? This is He who came by the water and blood, Jesus Christ. Not only by water, but by water and blood. It is the Spirit who bears witness because the Spirit is truth. Verse 7. For there are three that bear witness in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Spirit. And these three are one. Now look at If you were to look at this from top to bottom, you would have the Father, the Word, and the Spirit. Is everybody with me? Okay. And it says in, the, in, in verse 8, And there are three that bear witness on earth, the Spirit, the water, and the blood. Now if you'll grab your sheet, you'll see here that the Spirit, the water, and the blood. The Spirit is the Holy of Holies. The water represents the truth because the Bible says wash with the word. And the blood is the altar. Does everybody see that? So you see that the word says the gate of salvation. You're entering through the blood. Right? You're acknowledging the truth. And you're walking in the spirit. So every decision that you make Every decision you make, no matter what it is, because everything is a representation of the way, truth, and life, is either leading to life or to death. Every decision and choice that you make, every single day, is either leading to life or to death. Because if you're not walking in the way and obeying the truth, you're headed to death. Does everybody get it? But if you're walking in the way and submitting to the truth, you're headed towards life. So every decision and every choice that you make every single day, it could end up in a result of eternal death or eternal life. A choice that you make today. Does everybody get it? It's so important because we just lose sight of choices that we make. Every choice that you make is affecting whether you're heading toward life or towards death. Every day, what choice you make. So we see here that the Word tells us that there's three that bear witness in heaven. The Father, the Word, and the Spirit. Amen? That's a boundary line. <laughs> and it says, and there's three that bear witness on earth. The Spirit, which makes a connection between you and the Father. So if you ain't in the Spirit, you don't have a relationship. The water, which represents the truth, and the blood. So you have to come through the blood as the way. Acknowledge the truth so that you can walk in the Spirit. That's why the Bible says truth makes you free. Not what you believe makes you free. Amen. Truth does. There's a lot of people out there that believe, well, I believe this. That's too bad. You're still bound. And the reason why you believe that is because you're listening to the devil. Amen. Amen? Believe me. There's a lot of people that believe wrong things. And they'll swear to them. But they're headed on the way to death because it's not truth. That's why the Lord said, go. Let the blind lead the blind. Let the dead bury the dead. Which way were they going? They were not going the way of the truth, were they? And they were headed towards death. Okay. Hallelujah. Let's go to Hebrews 8. Praise be to God. Hebrews 8, starting at verse 3. For every high priest is appointed to offer both gifts and sacrifices. Therefore, it was necessary that the one who's talking about Christ also have something to offer. For if he were on earth, he would not be a priest since there are priests who offer the gifts according to the law, who serve the copy and the shadow of the heavenly things. Remember, I was sharing with you about 
The Old Testament was a shadow about the things to come. And they were actually doing the shadow of the things in heaven, weren't they? As Moses was divinely instructed when he was about to make the what? Tabernacle. For he said, See that you make all things according to the pattern shown you on the mountain. But now he has obtained a more excellent ministry inasmuch as he is also the mediator of a what? Better covenant, who is Jesus, which was established on better promises. Verse 7. For if that first covenant had been faultless, then no place would have been sought for a second. Because finding fault with them, he says, Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day when I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt, because they did not continue in my covenant. Because they what? Did not continue in my covenant. And I disregarded them, says the Lord. For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my laws in their mind. How is he going to do that? With his spirit. And write them on their hearts. And I will be their God and they shall be my people. Does everybody get that? That's through the spirit. Amen. So when you get baptized and filled with the Spirit of God, God's law is in you too. You know better. Amen. Every one of us knows better, even if you never read the Word in your life. You know better by the Spirit of the Lord. Because if you truly have fellowship in the Spirit, you know. He'll tell you, ooh, I'm going to tell you. When I got baptized and filled with the Spirit of God, I went into a place, because I didn't read the Word yet. I went into a place, it was all new age, and I didn't know. I picked up something and almost threw up. I dropped it. I remember one time that the Lord kept me in my bathroom because some girl from my past showed up in my front door. And I, I was getting ill and he wouldn't let me out. And I said, okay, I won't go out. I'll sit here and I'll obey. Just heal me. Get rid of it. And he said, okay, it was gone. And I stayed there until that girl left. Why? Because I was filled and baptized with the Spirit of God and I had a relationship in the Spirit. Not with the letter, but with the true Word who sent the Word. And where was it written? It was written in my mind or in my spirit, in my heart. And by His power, I was able to obey it. It was amazing because I, I would hear, don't do this. I would even hear the Word, thou shalt not do this. I'm thinking, whoa. And I didn't read the word yet. I'll never forget when I got off the plane to see my wife and when she wasn't my wife yet. And we were, you know, God sent me over there to New Mexico and uh, she looked at me and called me an alien and stuff. But I, when she, we talked about some things, I said, listen, i got to let you know right now we can't have sex. She said, what are you doing here? You know? Because she didn't know. But I knew, in my spirit, I knew I did not want to offend my father because I had a relationship in the spirit. Not with just a written letter, but in the spirit. Amen? Amen. Hallelujah. Okay. Let's go to chapter 9. And verse 1. Then indeed even the first covenant had ordinances of divine service and the earthly sanctuary. Verse 2. For a tabernacle was prepared, the first part in which was the lampstand, the table, and the showbread, which is called the sanctuary. And behind the second veil, remember I told you about the veils that were there? The part of the tabernacle which is called the holiest of all, which had the golden incense and the Ark of the Covenant overlaid on all sides with gold, and which were the golden pot that had the manna, Aaron's rod that budded, and the tab tablets of the covenant. And above it were the cherubim and the glory of the overshadowing the mercy seat of these things we cannot now speak in detail. So we see here that, you know, all of these things were a reflection of the Old Testament. 
and this Old Testament and this Old Covenant was being passed away. But it was actually being fulfilled. That's why it was being passed away. Does everybody get that? Okay? It was being fulfilled. Okay? Now, Jesus saying, I am the way, truth, and life. Let's go to Leviticus 23. Leviticus 23. Hallelujah. Now, there were feasts of the Lord. God gave feasts and representation of what Israel had to go through. What his people had to go through. There are seven feasts and the number seven means complete and perfect. Okay. Now, I'm not going to go in, in depth with these feasts because we have a teaching on feasts. But I want to show you how Jesus was the only one that could fulfill the feasts. All right. He, he, in fact... He speaks about the way, truth, and life and He fulfills these feasts. Now, we talked about, remember the Passover, the firstborn being killed, which was, we talked about that being the way because the blood makes the way. Okay? In Leviticus 23 and verse 4, and it says, And these are the feasts of the Lord. Holy convocation which you shall proclaim at their appointed times. On the fourteenth day of the first month at twilight is the Lord's Supper. Now, twilight is a time between just turning dark, isn't it? In fact, it's basically almost dark. He says, and you shall kill the lamb as the, as the Passover. And we know that Jesus was known as the lamb of the Passover. Amen? Okay. He was the lamb that was slain, wasn't it? Go to Matthew 27. You can keep your finger on Leviticus 23 if you want. Matthew 27. Hallelujah. <laughs> Glory to God. Matthew 27. Matthew 27 and verse 45. So if the blood had to make the way, right, then the cross is a representation of the way. Does everybody get it? The cross is the way because that's where the sacrifice was, wasn't it? The lamb that was sacrificed because the blood had to make the way. Okay? Now look out here in verse 45. Come on, everybody read it with me. Now from the sixth hour until the ninth hour, there was darkness over the land. Now, from the sixth hour to the ninth hour, it was from 12 noon till 3 p.m. Hebrew time. <laughs> All right? Now, this is Jesus hanging on the cross. In verse 46, And about the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice, saying, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? In verse 47, Some of those who stood there let me back up a little bit. Because I think we missed something. In verse 45 it said that darkness came over the land between 12 and 3. Remember the Lord said in the Passover when twilight comes, sacrifice the lamb. What did He do? He caused darkness to come over the earth just like He did in the, at twilight. So all the Jews that should have known what the feasts were, when they realized that it became dark, they should acknowledge that He was the Passover Lamb. <laughs> they should have gotten on their faces and realized that He was the Passover Lamb. Why? Because God made it dark. Just like He said, sacrifice the Lamb at twilight. I mean, everybody should have just been ripped out, man. He's God. He was the Passover Lamb, Right? Because he made it get dark between 12 noon and 3 p.m. Alright? 
And in Leviticus, what we just read, it said that to kill the sacrifice, sacrificial lamb at twilight, which means dark time. Okay. Let's go a little further. <laughs> as soon as I find my pain. Okay, uh, in verse 8, immediately one of them ran and took a sponge, filled it, and filled it with sour wine and put it on the reed and offered it to him to drink. And the rest said, let him alone. Let us see if Elijah will come to save him because he, they thought he cried out to Elijah. And Jesus cried out again with a loud voice and yielded up his spirit. Now look at in verse 51. This is important. Then behold, the veil of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. Now, yes, we know that God was making a way for man to be reconciled to God, right? But in, in, if you really think about it, it was God coming to the, reconciling himself to man. He was coming here. Okay. And, and the what? Earth quaked and the rocks were split. Now, verse 52, let's read this together. And the graves were opened, and many of bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep were raised. Now, listen. This is so important because Jesus is expressing the way, truth, and life right here. It's being fulfilled. When the Lord died on the cross, okay, the graves opened. And the bodies came. They didn't say that they were they were alive. Does everybody get it? Just the bodies showed up. The graves were open. When the graves were open, you could see the bodies. It says that the bodies were raised. That were asleep were raised. Now listen. In verse 53, he explains it. And coming out of the graves after. See the word after his resurrection. You know, if you think about it, the, the word says that when we're raptured, the dead will be raised first, won't they? And then those who are alive will be taken up. You know what? During the rapture, we may even see the graves open up. And we'll know we're next. <laughs> yeah! Now, I truly believe that um, these that were raised from the dead, it says, now verse 53 again, and coming out of the graves, after his resurrection, they went into the holy city and appeared to many. Now, I don't believe that these were the Old Testament saints. I believe that these were the saints that died during Jesus' ministry. Okay? I believe that these were the saints that died at Jesus' ministry because they went in to, to minister to the people in the city. Well, the Old, Old Testament saints wouldn't do too good in ministering to the people in the city, would they? No. Some of them wouldn't even recognize them. They were ministering to those who were alive. These were saints that died during Jesus' ministry. Okay? All right, hallelujah. So anyways, we see here that even during this, Jesus was fulfilling the way, truth, and life. The way being the cross. And we're going to go to the other part. The truth. In Ephesians... Well, Okay. Is everybody with me about the Passover? Jesus fulfilling the Feast of Passover by dying on the cross. Okay, the next feast in Leviticus 23 is called the Feast of Unleavened Bread. Alright? The word leaven means evil, wicked. Alright? Sin. And Jesus had to fulfill that. And He fulfilled the Feast of Unleavened Bread by descending into the depths of hell. Because your fight and my fight is against evil, isn't it? That's known as truth. One of the things in Ephesians 6.12 says that you and I do not fight flesh and blood, but the powers of darkness. Right? So we must understand that the truth is that that's who we're fighting. When Jesus says, I am the way, it represents the cross. When he says, I am the truth, it represents that he descended into the lower parts of the earth and destroyed the powers of darkness. The Bible says he disarmed the principalities and powers of darkness. And turn to Ephesians 4. Ephesians chapter 4. And verse 7.
let's read this together. But to each one of us, grace was given according to the measure of Christ's gift. Therefore, he says, when he ascended on high, he led captivity captive and gave gifts to men. Now this he ascended. <clears throat> what does it mean? But he also first descended into the lower parts of the earth. Well, he descended in the lower parts of the earth, didn't he? Because he went down and he kicked butt on the devil and to minister to those who were captive and let them know the truth that they could be released. That's a whole other teaching. But um, if you'll turn to 1 Peter 3, So the way is across. The truth is that he descended. <clears throat> First Peter chapter three and verse eighteen. Is everybody there? It says, "For Christ also suffered once for sins, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but made alive by the Spirit." by whom also he went and preached to the spirits in prison, who formerly were disobedient. So they couldn't have been the just ones from the past, could they? They were the disobedient ones from the past, weren't they? When once the divine long-suffering waited in the days of Noah, while the ark was being prepared in which a few, that is eight souls, were saved through water. He's talking about those that were destroyed during the flood that he went to go minister to. You know, one of the things that the devil does is he lies. <laughs> he can make you a lot of promises. And there's no guarantee that all of them left. Because some people still believe in the devil right now, don't they? They still believe in the promises of the devil. In fact, the devil still believes that he's going to beat God at the final end. He's the, not only the master of delusion, <laughs> he is the master of deception and walks in it his own self. <laughs> Amen? Amen. <laughs> so Jesus went down there to minister to those that were disobedient. So that they can make, go home. The righteous, he didn't need to minister. In fact, Jesus didn't go preach and say, ha ha, you blew it. He went and always preached, what? The kingdom. He preached salvation. So I can't imagine him going down there and saying, listen, this is what, this is what's happened. You guys blew it and you guys did it. And No. He went down there to the lost. Amen? He preached salvation to those who were lost. During the flood. Hallelujah. Okay. So we see here that Jesus fulfilled the first feast of Passover. The second feast of unleavened bread. Fulfilling the cross. Which is the way means the cross. The truth means he descended. Okay. And the life means. And the next feast would be the first fruits. Okay. The first fruits. That means he had to ascend, didn't he? So the way is the cross. The truth is he descended. The life is that he ascended and sent the spirit of life. Is everybody with me? And he also fulfilled the first three feasts. The feast of Passover, the feast of Unleaven, the feast of first fruits. And if you'll turn with me to 1 Corinthians 15. In verse 20. First, First Corinthians 15, verse 20. But now Christ has risen from the dead and has become the what? First fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For since by man came death, by man also came the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ all shall be made alive. But each one in his own order, Christ, the first fruits, afterward those who are Christ at his coming. So you and I are still part of his first fruits. 
as long as we continue on and maintain and don't go back serving the devil and break covenant with God. Amen? So we see here again, the way is the, is the, the, way is the cross, the truth is that He descended, the life is that He ascended and sent the Spirit of life. In fact, after His resurrection, 50 days afterwards, He sent the Holy Spirit, which is known as Pentecost. And he, and see, so Jesus, in true reality, and just his death on the cross, going to hell, and rising to the, fulfill the first three fruit, first three feasts. All right, go to John two. John chapter two. Hang on, we're almost done. A couple more scriptures. John chapter 2. So you never realize how Jesus saying, I am the way, truth, and life is truly expounded on everything. That's how everything is. Everything is leading either to life or death. Depending on whether you're walking in a way and obeying the truth. And John chapter 2 and verse 13. Now the Passover of the Jews was at hand and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. What was at hand? The Passover. And he found in the temple those who sold oxen, sheep and doves and money changers doing business. He went into the temple or what you might call the tabernacle. Okay? And he made a whip of cords and he drove them out. He drove them all out of the temple with the sheep and the oxen and poured out the changers poured out the changer's money and overturned the tables. Remember I share with you, that's what God does in, Ill, in us. And he said to those who sold doves, take these things away. Do not make my father's house a house of merchandise. Then his disciples remembered that it was written, zeal for your house has eaten me up. So the Jews answered and said to him, what sign do you show to us since you do these things? And Jesus answered and said to them, destroy this temple and three days I will raise it up. And the Jews said, it has taken 46 years to build this temple and you're going to raise it up in three days? But he was speaking of the temple of his body. Why? Because he was the true tabernacle. Therefore, when he had risen from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this to them and they believed the scripture and the word which Jesus had said. Now listen. He said, I'll destroy this temple. In three days, I'll raise it. Three days. Three feasts. Does everybody get it? Each feast was fulfilled for each day. The, the, the feast of Passover. The feast of unleavened. And the feast of first fruits. Jesus being the way known as the cross, the truth knowing is that he descended and destroyed the works of the enemy, and a life knowing that he rose and he ascended to the right hand of the Father and set the spirit of life and gave life to all men as first fruits. Amen? Amen. Hallelujah. Now, let's go to 1 Corinthians 3. Hallelujah. Verse 16. First Corinthians 3, verse 16. It says, Do you not know that you are what? The temple of God, and that the Spirit of God dwells in you. Verse 17. If anyone defiles the temple of God, God will what? Destroy him. For the temple of God is holy, which temple is you are. Go to chapter 6. Chapter 6 and verse 12. 
Paul stated, he said, all things are lawful for me, but all things are not what? Helpful. All things are lawful for me, but I will not be brought under the power of any. Foods for the stomach. Seems to be the biggest stumbling block to many. If the devil can't kill you with sin, he'll kill you with what you eat. <laughs> foods for the stomach and the stomach for foods, but God will destroy both it and them. Now the body is not for sexual immorality, but for the Lord and the Lord for the body. And God both raised up the Lord and will also raise us up by His power. But you... Do you know? Do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ? Shall I then take the members of Christ and make them members of a harlot? Certainly not. Or do you not know that he who is joined to a harlot is one body with her? For the two, he says, shall become one flesh. But he who is joined to the Lord is one spirit with him. Flee sexual immorality. Every sin that a man does is outside the body. But he who commits sexual immorality sins against his own body. Or do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God, and you are not your own? For you were bought at a price, therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. Now let's close with Ephesians 5. Hallelujah. Jesus, the way, truth, and life. Ephesians chapter 5. Praise be to God. And verse 8. Let's read this all together, okay? Ephesians 5, verse 8. For you were once darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of light, for the fruit of the Spirit is in all goodness, righteousness, and truth. Finding out what is acceptable to the Lord, and have no fellowship with unfruitful works of darkness, but rather expose them. For it is a shameful even to speak of those things which are done by them in secret. But all things that are exposed are made manifest by the light. For whatever a man makes itself, it's light. Therefore, he says, Awake you who sleep, arise from the dead, and Christ will give you light. <clears throat> See that you walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise, redeeming the time because the days are evil. Therefore, do not be unwise, but understand what the will of the Lord is. And do not be drunk with wine in which dissipation, but be filled with the Spirit, speaking to one another in psalms and in hymns, spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord, giving thanks always for all things to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, submitting to one another in the fear of God. Jesus, the way, truth, and life. Remember, every decision you make is either headed toward life or death. Remember what Jesus has done for you on the cross. The way is the cross. The truth is that He descended and the life that He ascended in resurrection. And we are now the first fruits. Let's continue on that we maintain the first fruits. Amen? Amen. Father, we thank You for Your Word. We plead the blood of Jesus on the seed that was imparted tonight, Lord. I ask, Father, that by your Spirit that you illuminate the seed and give us more understanding and bring us counsel, correction, and direction, Lord, if we're not walking in the way or the truth. If there's anything in our life, Lord, anything whatsoever that we need to relinquish that would maintain us and keep us in walking in the way, truth of life, that would continue to lead us to life, Help us, Lord, and remove those things from us and reveal them to us. And we promise to give you all the glory in Jesus' name. And everybody said...
Amen and hallelujah.